Hi everyone, today we are unboxing something that was sent in by Mike McLoon and he also sent in this. How cool is that? Those of you who know, this is not the one that fell, that's the other one. So. So today we're looking at the Mike McLoon Minibus 10 channel passive summing mixer. Now a bit of a disclaimer, I know Mike personally, I consider him a good friend, we've worked together on a few projects before. Mike sent this in for a characterization and I'm taking the opportunity to turn this into a review because why not? So let's have a look. Packaging is the uh, Dave Jones style. Sort of the Dave Jones no BS standard. And it looks actually quite professional for a little one man company. Made in the EU. And let's see what we have inside. Yeah, this all looks very, very good. You know what we say here on the EV blog? Don't turn it on, take it apart. So, looking at this a little closer, we can see that the ground connections are all straight connected to the ground plane, where the plus and minus signal connections all go to 10k resistors, and then in the middle you see a summing lane. And the summing lane goes straight back to the output. So what that means for the circuit is you've got 10 kilo ohms on the plus side, 10 kilo ohms on the minus side and then between minus and plus on the output there's 220 ohms to be honest it probably would have been better if that had been 200 ohms because for the gain calculation it works out that the gain is 220 divided by 20k which is 0.011 or minus 39 something something db ideal would have been if that was exactly 200 ohms then the gain from every input to the output would have been exactly minus 40 db now it's minus 39 points something. So Mike obviously is a musician and musicians like to use their jack plugs and he's got a really nice new trick jack plug on it, which is all well and cool. But of course I am not a musician because I cannot play music to save my life and I'm using analyzer equipment which always has XLR plugs. Would be nice if the whole world would start using the uh, combo jack XLR plugs, but I understand that they're very expensive, but I am going to have to go and make one, two, three, four, five uh, Jack 2 XLR female cables and at least one, two Jack 2 XLR male cables now. Always good to have in your toolbox anyway. All right, let's get going. Well, boys, I reckon this is it. All right, so I've got it hooked up with one input here and one output on either side. So first thing we should do is measure the gain, which we calculated to be minus 39 and something. There we go. It is minus 39.347. But the interesting part is when I add other inputs, here's the channel, changes the gain a little bit. See, every time I plug in another input, the gain goes down. The reason for that is that one channel is actually outputting a signal back into the other channel with, with which it's now connected, yeah? And the input source impedance is about 100 ohms. So it's trying over this 10 kilo ohm input impedance to pull down the input. 
we add all the inputs and we have only one output active which is channel 3 coming in here and channel 4 coming in here we now have a gain mismatch from 39.3 to 39.7 about 0.5 db that we lose sending it back to the input impedances of the other channels so this is with one channel active and you will see if I add more channels that obviously the output of channel one goes up, yeah, because I'm summing up more input channels. So this is two channels, three, four, five. And the question is, do they add linearly? And in order to figure that out, we need to undo this gain of 39 points. What was it? 39.71 dB. And if we normalize to that, let's see if we can measure the gain per input. So we go to a step level sweep where we measure the gain multiple times for different inputs. And here we add a gain of 7.15. And now we see, so the first time I ran it was with one input active. The blue line is the right channel, the lower channel that you see over there. That still has the reference gain of a little bit more. And then the upper one, is I think the blue line. Yeah, that is the blue line. That now comes out to exactly one, which makes sense. So I'm artificially adding another 39.715, and that would bring that channel up to zero dB, which is one. And what I've done here is I've actually run the signal generator from one millivolt to two volts. So you can also see the integral linearity. Adding up this 39.715 dB gives me exactly one here and then you see that in the lower regions there is a little bit of non-linearity which honestly is probably the audio precision itself so then we activate another input and we see that the output goes to two so i'm measuring linear gain here correcting exactly for unity gain for one input so if i now have two inputs active i should get double the output which works then we add the third output and we come up exactly to three. We add the fourth output, we come up to four. We add the fifth output, come up exactly to five. That's a quite interesting and comprehensive way to measure the linearity. And it seems that they're all adding up very nicely. Could you tell me what it's about? So here we're measuring the crosstalk. So I'm essentially giving a signal only to channel three, which is this input right here, which should only come out to channel two on the output and should not come out to channel one because they are completely different circuit boards. And again, we're running up to the, to the limit of the audio precision. Now, if I make it only channel four, it should, be, it should be exactly the other way around. Channel one should measure a lot of correlation. Channel two, again, close to the limits. Probably even turn on all the other channels. Channel two should get nothing of this. Wow. Okay, let's demonstrate the mixing functionality here. Again, I've got two channels going in, three and four. Number three here. Number four here, two outputs, left here and right here. And now they're both giving out one kilohertz. But now if I make it two different sine waves, you'll see two different outputs. Channel two is outputting 440 hertz, which is coming in over here. And channel one is outputting the one kilohertz. But now I can also add a little bit of 440 hertz to channel one. We'll just turn down channel two off for a moment. I'll add this. And you see that they perfectly mix. There is no intermodulation or anything. Spectrum is extremely flat. There you go. Unfortunately, you can only make two different sources here. Otherwise, I would add a few other frequencies. But yeah, I can add a few more channels. And it will mix quite nicely without any intermodulation. Because intermodulation is an artifact of nonlinear amplification. And we don't do any amplification here, at least not in the box. We just do summing over resistors. And let's be honest, the resistor nonlinearity is going to be way, way, way lower than my analyzer nonlinearity. The mixing here is, is absolutely perfect. The only downside is that you lose you know, 40 dB of signal, so you need to gain it back up. But it might be more linear to mix passively with a huge loss of gain and then gain it back up with a low noise amplifier rather than trying to mix actively because then you get intermodulation problems so architecturally it's actually a very nice idea to mix passively and take the 
the hit and signal to noise ratio if you have a good low noise post amplifier. So let's actually measure official intermodulation first with one channel. So I've got channels three and four, which are the leftmost channel inputs, straight to the outputs. Other channels are disabled. So this is background noise. Now we'll measure it again. We'll add in more channels and this will give us more signal. So the distance to the noise might be greater. And that's exactly what we see. So the channel one version is now lower and that's the one with five inputs. So we have more signal, the same noise. So the ratio of signal to noise is actually improving. Whereas the other one, the reference channel, our control group, you know, science should be with control groups. We forgot about that. It's exactly the same as before. Go to a level sweep. Yeah, we'll go to two volt again. Then do 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 do. First we start with the control measurement. Cool. Now we will add in more channels. Exactly the same thing seems to happen. We have more signal, therefore the ratio of signal to noise is also higher. And that just tells us that at this point we are measuring noise and not intermodulation. If it would be intermodulation, more signal would lead to more, more intermodulation and clearly not the same or less. Okay, I'm clutching at straws to find something wrong with this thing. So let's measure frequency response. I find it hard to believe that that simple layout could have a frequency response, but reference measurement. Okay, so the channel one has a little bit less gain, as we noticed before, because the source also has to feed, back feed the other few channels. And there is a little bit of a dip over 50 kilohertz, which is interesting. And now we'll turn on the other channels and run again. And obviously we now have more gain again, but I would say that the frequency response is very, very much the same. Let's zoom in here a little bit. Yeah, so we lose a tenth of a dB between 20 and 50 hertz, and there's a little swing up after 50 hertz, uh, 50 kilohertz. But, you know, don't get excited. It's 0.05 dB. So really, this is all I can actually think about measuring here. On a passive device, there's, there's really not much to go after. We can see if the noise floor improves a little bit. Okay, so let's look at noise levels. Again, we start with the reference measurement, put in two volts RMS. And channel two, which is run off of only one input, has one point something microvolt RMS, which is minus 118 dB volts. Channel one has a little bit more because the other channels are contributing a little bit, even though it's even though they're not actually active. But now if we turn the other channels on, yeah, it stays roughly the same. That's interesting. 116 dB. So it's not important whether we turn these channels on or not. Even with these channels off, they are adding noise until I probably unplug them by hand. Hundred sixteen seven. No, actually stays the same. And now I have no inputs or no generators connected to the mixer at all. So what I'm actually looking at is the audio precision noise floor. So that's actually very nice. The noise floor at this point is unmeasurable. And it also means that on the audio precision, the analyzer's noise dominates the generator. So I can plug all the generators back in. We stay at the same noise floor. One generator. Two generators. Four generators. Five. This man is obviously a psychotic. Same noise floor. Very good. So here's a little modification I did. I used the bus outputs from the boards to route to a little switch with which you can either disconnect the two boards or connect the two boards and make it a mono mixer. Let's see if that works. Okay, we finished the modification. So now I'm feeding it 
one kilohertz on the one channel and 432 on the second channel. Mike, if you're watching, you'll know why I'm using 432. And the device is in stereo mode, which means that both of the channels are independent. But if I flick the switch, I will now connect both of the mixes, which means, first of all, that the outputs will be connected to each other, so they'll be the same. But also the inputs will be connected. So now I have a 10 channel mixer with one channel output. So we'll see that if I flick it to mono mode, we now get a mix of the uh, 1 kHz and the 432. Watch this. There we go. You now have a 10 channel, 10 input, 1 channel mixer. So I think that would be a, a nice addition to this device. It's almost free, you just have to add the switch and do the wiring. So who am I kidding? It's not free, it's actually manual labor. But I think it would be a very wise addition. So it makes the device just a little bit more versatile. And, you know, why not? That's it. Bye.